Hello and welcome back, listener. I hope you're well. You are listening to My Surrogacy Journey, the podcast. This is season three. We're taking you on a journey of education and surrogacy storytelling. I'm Wes. I'm your host today. Unfortunately, Michael isn't here today, so you just have me. I kind of like it, though, because I don't have to get interrupted and stuff. So I'm really not really happy, but kind of actually really enjoying it. We have a really interesting episode today for you all about intended parents journey and what it looks like from a clinic perspective. Some of those things that you should really ask, some of the things that you should look out for and really kind of what makes a good clinic from a surrogacy perspective. So there's there's lots of things we're going to pick up in that today. We do have a fabulous sponsor for season three podcast. This is Manchester Fertility. They were founded in 1985 and have an exceptional team of fertility doctors, nurses, embryologists and patients supporting anyone going through surrogacy in the UK and you're going to hear from their surrogacy lead today, Olivia. Manchester Fertility remains one of the leading fertility clinics in the country to this day, delivering more than 8,000 babies. For intended parents seeking surrogacy support, Manchester Fertility is My Surrogacy Journey's Northern and Midlands Centre of Excellence, offering surrogacy advice and fertility treatment options for gay, bi, queer and trans men and heterosexual single and couples, helping them to navigate their way through their surrogacy journey. For this episode, we'll be talking to two familiar people. And if you follow my surrogacy journey, you will have definitely heard of these two wonderful people. Debbie, Olivia, thank you for being here today. Olivia, shall I call you Olivia or shall I call you Liv? What, what's the what's the rule? I'm happy with either. Everyone tends to call me Liv, so I'm fine with that. Liv, we'll stick yeah. it at Liv and uh, Debbie or Debbie, Deb, whatever, I, you know, <laughs> you, you're used to me by now. So thank you both for being here. So Debbie, you're clearly here as our My Surrogacy Journey clinical lead to help people understand how that part plays from a My Surrogacy Journey point of view, but also... You are very, very experienced within this industry and have a wealth of experience around compliance, HFEA, general clinical procedures. Uh, so I think your input today is going to be very valuable. Thank you, Wes. Looking forward to it. And then Liv, you know, you are really trying to help people understand, one, generally what a good surrogacy clinic looks like, you know, yeah. given the programme that you have with Manchester Fertility, but also what patients can expect. And also your experience, you know, you deal first hand with intended parents. I think a lot of people approach clinics and don't know what to expect. So I'm hoping that the listener today can understand what that clinical process should look like so that when they do embark on surrogacy and do need to start thinking about, you know, interacting with the clinic, whether you're with My Surrogacy Journey or if you're doing it independently, you, you are, you're better prepared. You're, you're better emotionally prepared, you're better mentally prepared and you have a real general understanding of what that process could be. So let's jump straight into it. Why don't you both give yourself a little intro? Because I probably can't do it justice. Olivia, why don't we start? Olivia, why don't we start with you? So I'm Olivia. I'm the surrogacy coordinator at Manchester Fertility. I deal with all intended parents and surrogates that are coming through treatment with ourselves, right from their initial inquiry up to the point that they've completely finished treatment with with ourselves. I'm the kind of first point of contact for patients. I'm there to answer any questions or queries and point them in the right direction, really. And I have to say, it's really lovely to hear another Northern voice on this <laughs> podcast because often it's all and only me. So it puts me at ease hearing your Northern tones. So thank you. And Deb, come on, give us your, you're like the resident like uh, <laughs> clinician on here now. So for those of you who haven't listened to a podcast, maybe with Debbie on it, Debbie, give us a quick intro. So I'm Debbie Evans. I'm the clinical lead for MSJ and have a really exciting role within the team in that I see all intended parents, surrogates and no-neg donors from a clinical perspective. So remember, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. And so we have a conscious thing to decide whether any of the patients or members coming through MSJ are being looked after safely so that's that's my key role to make sure but today we are talking about intended parents so I'll focus more on those today and I think that's worth pointing out again you know so if you are a member of my surrogacy journey you would typically get an uh, a consultation with Debbie you know to uh, 
talk through all of those clinical aspects, make sure you meet you meet the criteria for surrogacy from a clinical point of view. But also Debbie is your point of contact. So if you do have any clinical related questions, Debbie kind of introduces you to that kind of space and she's there throughout your journey. So if you don't listen to this podcast and you want to understand the clinical elements that are applicable to you, Debbie would help help you do them. But you would also still get that level of support from say Liv when you made that initial inquiry as well. So yeah. Thank you both for being here. I'm really looking forward to kind of exploring some of those elements. There's a lot to cover, so we will get through as quickly as possible. So we all know surrogacy is complex and that everyone comes at surrogacy from a different point. Everyone has different components to their journey and everyone has different needs moving forward. And I suppose it's your job, both of you, clinically to assess what's right for them. So why don't we kind of shine a light on the process? And I know it can be quite a daunting experience, but Debbie is our clinical lead. How do IPs feel when they begin the process and what do we do differently to support them? You just used a word that I was going to use. It is daunting. Mostly our intended parents will come to us. They will have some knowledge. They will have done their research. Some will think that they know more than they need to know. But when they come through us, they will get all of the correct information that's current for this moment in time so that then they can make informed decisions about the type of journey that they want to do. So it is daunting. Where do they start? How do they know that this journey is right for them? That's MSJ's business to make sure that they have all of the correct information so they can make decisions about where they start and where they go from here. You know, all of the types of questions, even when they've been through UWES or been through some of our coordinators by the time they get to me from a clinical perspective they still have lots of questions how do we make sure that child's ours what's the law regarding taking our baby home and making sure that that baby is is ours Um, how will I know that the surrogate's right for us where do we get our donor from where do we start with all of this so our job is to make sure that we give them all of the information and there's lots of options. There's no right or wrong for anyone. Everyone's journey is unique to them and different to them. Um, and that's really key to take home. Even when you're thinking about choosing if you're in a same-sex male couple and you want to choose an egg donor, where do we start with all of that? And how do we make sure that that egg donor is going to be right for us? Where do we start with picking our surrogate? And how do we know what's going to be correct for us? So lots and lots of information. But to start off, we need to make sure that you're safe. And so from a clinical perspective, I will do a full medical consultation with you for both the partners in the in the intended parent relationship to make sure that there's nothing that contravenes you going through this intended journey. It could be that you're on a medication that may affect your sperm and you don't know that until you have that conversation. Or you've had a semen analysis and I'm interpreting that result for you And there's parameters that are low or poor. And perhaps we need to think about how we're going to affect that. I'll talk to you about your social behaviours. So whether you smoke, vape, take recreational drugs, drink alcohol, they are all really important and will affect your parameters within your sperm count. So it's really important that I have a very transparent, honest conversation with you about your behaviours. And yeah. how you're, you know, if, whether you're fit for fertility. Yeah. And that's really key. It is. And I think you raise a good point there, Debbie, because I think, you know, if you look at our membership community, we've got the heterosexual community and we've got the same sex community. Most of our heterosexual community will be very familiar with the fertility space and will be very familiar with all of those components. They might have to look at it through a different lens, through a surrogacy lens, which is something that they might not have prepared for. And I know at that point you would help them understand that. You know, some of the things that spring to mind is about, you know, often with our heterosexual couples now embarking on surrogacy is that their embryos weren't created uh, for the use of surrogacy so that they might need to have some more retrospective screening doing or they might need to have different consents done and I know the consultation you do and I know that you focus heavily there on sperm but there are lots of different components and often our same-sex couples or single people they won't have even really experienced anything to do with the fertility clinic and most of them may not have even done uh, a semen analysis before so they don't know where, where, where their sperm health is so I think your first point of call and trying to assess all of those parameters and starting to help them think about how they are going to impact their own fertility is a really important piece again it's about helping them focus on the steps that are relevant at that time yeah. often intended parents when they're starting whether it be as a result of fulfilled fertility or you know starting a journey uh, 
as a same-sex couple or single person is that they often have an, a view of what the journey looks like and often after that call that you've both had it really changes their view of it whether that's from a time frame from whether that's you know legal compliance around quarantine you know I think it's really good and really important that you know if you have decided that surrogacy is your journey and you're going to do the IVF route that you really speak nice and early to professionals whether that's if you're doing an independent journey and you you know, you think your clinic is the first point of contact and you end up coming through to live and then she starts to help you understand all of those processes or whether you speak to us and become a member and then have those calls with Debbie. It's really, really important to kind of get a, a real understanding of that whole process, isn't it? Yeah, and I, and I think, as you say, when we're talking about um, same-sex couples, that they underestimate that they've even got a fertility issue mm -hmm. because they haven't known that they've got a fertility issue. They're now just embarking on a journey through surrogacy because that is their means to parenthood but I've never had to test it in the past of course and so sometimes we get some quite shocking results um that that I then have to be really transparent and deliver those results in a conducive way to say okay this is what we can fix and this is what we yeah. can't and this is this is the other options that we might have so sometimes you're having very difficult conversations but most of the time they're good conversations or it could be that we need to consider some lifestyle changes mm -hmm. to optimise and to make the best for your gametes, yeah, whether exactly. they're eggs or sperm. And you mentioned it earlier, you know, yeah. it sounds really cl cliche, but like being fit for fertility, but it is about understanding mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to start on this journey, you need to know what you're dealing with, you know, and if you have low sperm parameters or if you have a low AMH or all of those elements are going to impact how you move forward. So it's really important that we know about them early so that we can factor that into the plan. What sometimes happens is they get so far down the line and then they realize there's an issue. And we, that's really what we're structured for, for um, an MSJ point of view. But I know at Manchester Fertility as well, it's about... You, you take a very similar approach to, to how you assess people's, you know, potential for the journey. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think my initial call with a lot of intended parents is very similar to yours, Debbie, but obviously from a non-clinical perspective, it's kind of just making patients aware of our processes and timescales and things like that and things that they need to consider because a lot of the time, the majority of the patients that I speak to, they have no knowledge of surrogacy. That you mm -hmm. know, they've not done any research. A lot of the time, I'm the first call that they're making. So probably from their perspective, I'm bombarding them with information, but I just wanna make sure that I'm giving them as much information as I possibly can. And then they can go away and think about it and kind of move from there onwards. Yeah, It's about helping them understand the process. Cause like yeah. you said, sometimes they don't know anything and they are right at the start, which is great that they're reaching out to get that support to the professionals who can help them but I think they, they, they have no way of comprehending what, yeah. what is coming but also the conversation you're having is about this piece yeah it's not necessarily about all of it if I go back to our journey you know Michael and I and we, when we first started thinking about it we didn't have an organization like MSJ to, to work with our first point of contact was the clinic yeah yeah and we relied on them to educate us but that wasn't their job. They educated us on the bits we thought we needed educating on, but there was so much more to it. Yeah. And you know, and, that, and that's what we learned, and that's why we created my surrogacy journey. But, but we did make lots of mistakes. You know, we didn't understand the time frame. We didn't understand the cost. We didn't understand the impact of choosing a donor. Yeah. We didn't consider future journeys at the start, and we just made loads of mistakes, and we navigated through it. And I think because. I'm sure you all know what Michael and I are like now, but we did navigate through it with we Tenacious and, and we got through it and we did the best that we did. But, you know, when you look back on both of our journeys, even when we changed clinic for Duke, we still made mistakes. We still kind of didn't that's, that's, fully understand it. That's the absolute beauty of, of why you've created MSJ and what is transpiring now so that we're pretty confident that the intended parents that we then send through to clinics we know the results, they have been prepared, they have more knowledge in how the whole pathway is going to work and how it's going to evolve. And they are prepared for those future journeys so that, you know, by the time that they do get to clinics, you're not having to have those very in-depth conversations because we've done a majority of that work for you so that yeah. they are prepared. So we're working in collaboration so that we're really confident that the IPs that come to you now are armed with with the correct knowledge that yeah. they've been given that they have they have the information so that they're pretty sure then about the journey that's about to 
unfold for them. And that's what's really lovely and really positive now from when I started first started working in surrogacy and, you know, in the same way back in the clinics when we were dealing with with IPs and surrogates that had come through with zero knowledge, Mm -hmm. thought that they knew, but, you know, had no idea about how it was going to work. And so the introduction of MSJ and what we do for our um, members and patients coming through us is really positive and really collaborative with the clinics so that we're all singing from the same song sheet. Crux of it is, is that the intended parents and the surrogates and the no-neg donors are armed with information so that and they do you, can make... Do you, Liv, do you see that and the, the difference between the consultations with those that have called you up with no experience versus the kind of patients that you deal with that come from my surrogacy journey? Definitely. I can definitely see a massive difference. The patients that you guys refer over to us, the things that I go through with them, which is, would be my kind of usual one-to-one call, they already know everything. So <laughs> uh, there's only things that are very specific to our clinic that they don't really know about, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of costings and timescales and sure. things like that. But the majority of the information that I would give like a, an initial inquiry, they already know all of that. So definitely makes my job a lot, a lot easier. So we're clearly doing our so job. That, yeah, that's absolutely. amazing. Exactly. It's yeah. working. Absolutely. The system is working. <laughs> Let, let's talk about how do you choose that clinic? Because, you know, we talk about the partner clinics that we're part with, particularly uh, Manchester Fertility. What should intended parents look like? You know, if they, you know, obviously as, a, as an organisation, we can help people choose their clinic and help them, help educate them about what good looks like. But what are the types of things that, let's just use uh, Manchester Fertility as, as a good example. What are the kind of things that intended parents should be expecting uh, of a clinic that has a really well-established surrogacy programme? Because let's be really honest, that a lot of clinics in the UK say they do surrogacy and, you know, they might do one or two cycles Doing one or two cycles here doesn't make you a centre of excellence. It doesn't make you an expert surrogacy. It doesn't make you experienced. We all know surrogacy is complex. There's lots of different elements to consider. What are the type of things, Liv, that Manchester Fertility do uh, and have to demonstrate that they have uh, an established and successful surrogacy programme? So I think for starters, from an intended parent point of view, you should definitely look to see if that specific clinic has a surrogacy team. I think because surrogacy is so complex, I think having an already established team at the clinic is a green flag straight away. We've got our own surrogacy team that's been handpicked from wealth of experience and expertise in um, IVF and surrogacy. So every single one of our team are in the clinic you know from Monday to Sunday at some point you know we're here to answer any questions queries and we're there to help patients and you're dealing with it all week aren't you it's not yeah. like you surrogacy you just don't dip in and dip out of it surrogacy no. kind of goes and follows through and as an established clinic I know that you have a, an established team I met them all and surrogacy flows all of the time and it's not something that is only available on a Monday no absolutely there's always you know somebody that needs something at seven o'clock at night or two o'clock in the morning and then I'll come in in the morning that'll be the first thing that I do when I get there and it is a lot of work and I think it surrogacy needs a dedicated team especially with how big surrogacy is now you know I've seen a massive difference in the past six months at how many inquiries we get every week every month it has tripled it's so so big now if you was to look into a clinic and they didn't really have a surrogacy team and it was just kind of their their usual kind of patient coordinators that dealt with surrogacy to me that would be a little bit of a red flag as a starting point Mm -hmm. because they're not actually going to be able to best advise you and like we've just mentioned earlier sometimes they rely on the clinic to give the advice and if that clinic isn't experienced in giving that advice are they going to really give them the right advice do they have that experience of being able to really help people exactly. navigate of giving the expectation of what of what surrogacy is but more importantly what surrogacy isn't and you know i know that you have a broad understanding of the law and and you you're able to help people and patients under understand that as well yeah definitely i think from my perspective i think it's better for intended parents and surrogates to have one person in particular to go to because you don't want to be ringing up and explaining your journey and your situation to multiple multiple different people Mm -hmm. because it just gets frustrating and with the process you know a lot of processes being complex and them being quite lengthy in terms of time it's hard when patients do have to deal with multiple different people yeah um so i think it definitely puts patients at ease when they are 
dealing with just one person in particular yeah. um, that knows exactly what their journey is. And I think what's important with clinics who have experience around surrogacy is that it's about terminology, it's about language, it's about understanding the process. That's why we work with specific clinic partners at My Surrogacy Journey, because we have absolute confidence that they understand all of these elements and that they're going to treat each member or patient with respect. They're going to understand their situation. They're not going to be, as for a same-sex couple, they're not just going to be talking to one of the patients and, and excluding the other one, which is the experience Michael and I had. All of the partners we work with and those experienced clinics will always look at a set of intended parents as the intended parents and yeah. that, that even though one of them might be using their sperm both of them are equally as invested in in that process and both of them should be managed and, and consulted with as a collective rather than just one and I think that's really important you know and I think it's about if, if you're a heterosexual member it's about that that clinic understanding where you've been and what you're now faced with and, and how that impacts you emotionally and how they can better advise you about what is often really complex cases, you know. And I think a surrogacy a centre of excellence or one with really real experience will absolutely know how to handle you in the context of moving forward with surrogacy. Do you agree, Debbie? I absolutely agree. Success rates is also really important yeah, to consider. that's a good point. Have a look at the success rates of that clinic, particularly for surrogacy. And yeah. although the HFEA doesn't demand that we promote or process those results as yet it is coming and if you want to advertise yourself as a surrogacy center of excellence then you be should be promoting your success yeah. rates too because they're really important to know and i think i get asked this question a lot around success rates and if you do go on the hfea website it's quite complex and the success rates are all around different age groups and categories and there's lots of different things to look at but in the context of surrogacy what you have to remember is that any success rates that are published are often focused on heterosexual people who have fertility issues so the success rate that that clinic is is showing you or that you're seeing on, on a website isn't often representative of your case. And we always need to look at all of that in the round. So if you were a heterosexual couple doing surrogacy, then that success rate is probably more aligned to your situation and is probably closer to what the success rates might be if you were doing surrogacy. There, there's always a caveat there is because you're potentially using a surrogate who's a good candidate, who's got all of the criteria. So that success rate in theory should be higher because of that of that uh, factor ask, ask the question when you go to your clinic ask that specific question every clinic with all of the data that they have available to them will be able to give you a bespoke to you um, success rate based on your circumstances yep. and anyone that promotes that they are a surrogacy center of excellence will have that information yeah. so just ask the question it is and you should have the confidence to ask the question yeah, you should always. never be shy of asking it yeah. you, they, you should always be really confident in being able to ask those questions and any any clinic who you know works with surrogacy uh, patients should be able to answer that question and then the second piece really is about those same-sex couples or s single people uh, who are embarking on surrogacy potentially using donor eggs now the current success rates will not be representative because if you are a single person or a couple both creating embryos and either you and your partner have got healthy sperm, you're using a donor who is potentially of optimum age and has all the meets all the, the criteria and characteristics and you are using a surrogate who's got proven fertility as an ideal candidate and is both clinically and mentally fit. Those success rates should be much higher. I wouldn't want to hazard a guess, but I would say they'd be significantly higher, you know. They are. It, in general, you can expect in those circumstances, and of course everyone's going to be slightly different depending on the parameters around their gametes, etc. Um, but you can expect up to 30% higher success rates from a normal IVF cycle which is around 40 to 50 percent to 70 plus percent mm -hmm. for in surrogacy, because as you've just stated, whereas all of those parameters are of a higher value. Yeah. And so yeah. success will be higher. It is. And, and, and what I would say, as, as you said, Debbie, and, and I'm sure people would ask you, Liv, is that ask about the success rates yeah. specific to your situation yeah. because and then you're going to potentially make more informed decisions on data that's relevant to you. And that's what I talk about all of the time, because people do talk about success rates. And I think 
the HFEA, not beating the HFEA here, but they currently don't capture data on same-sex couples. So no data that's on the HFE website related to success rates is any way relevant to same-sex. Now that is changing moving forward. And as an organization, we're going to be encouraged and working with clinics to help people have more transparency about what the perceived success rates are uh, specifically to them. And that there's more to come on that. But I think that's definitely one that intended parents should be really confident in asking. And if you aren't able to get an answer, you know, you were talking about red flags earlier. Liv. Yeah. That that is one of those red flags. You know, you yeah. any clinic should be able to give you transparent data, and that's relevant to your. Trust me, Wes. The fertility industry is obsessed with statistics. Mm-hmm. They they are obsessed with collecting their own individual success rates. The clinics have had lots of issues around the uh, electronic data inputting over the last few years, and the introduction of Prism has, has stalled things for a little bit. But clinics are still collecting their own data. So they have that and data. And they have that information, trust me. There we go. You've heard so it from a really it. trusted source. They yeah, have it. They have uh, it. It's so about making them. sure, but also yeah. make sure it's relevant to you so that you can put it in the context yeah. of how to help you make make a decision. Now, Debbie, we talked about HFEA there. Just give us a quick overview of those. If you don't know what the HFEA is, please tell us, Debbie. So the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority was founded from the HFE Act in 1990. So that is an act of parliament that dictates and governs practice within the fertility sector in the UK. So it gives us a code of practice. It tells us what we can and can't do. And we're strictly bound by that within the fertility sector. So each clinic needs to be licensed to the HFEA to perform or allow um, those clinics to perform those actual treatments, including IUI, IVF, ICSI, PICSI, surrogacy. So all of those. And they're licensed against that code of practice. And each clinic will have regular inspections to make sure that they are compliant with that code of practice. So essentially, it's the regulator, yeah. isn't it? For the so. And now just a quick question. Do clinics who do surrogacy have to have a specific surrogacy license? No, not at the moment. Any clinic can do within the realms of their license, gamete collection. So whether it's eggs and sperm, how they collect those, as long as it's within their licensed activities, they can do that. And that includes surrogacy or egg donation or sperm donation, any of those within their licensed practice. So do they have to, does it have to specifically say surrogacy in their license or does it come as standard? No, it comes as standard. So that potentially will change with the law reforms Mm -hmm. and depending on how or if the HFEA take that on board, whether that will change in the future. But for now, any clinic can practice surrogacy because they have a license to do so. Which is often why you see those clinics just doing a small amount of surrogacy and not necessarily a lot. And I think what is fair to say is that some clinics really invest and in their programs and want to proactively do surrogacy. And some clinics don't do it at all and won't touch surrogacy because it's too complex. And some clinics will kind of dip in and out of it depending on how they want to move forward. The the HFEA have have recognition, they have taken on board that there is potential that they will need to regulate surrogacy in a much more proactive way. Um, You know, if if a clinic wants to do PGS, for example, Mm -hmm. they have to have an addition to their licence in order to do that. And I think that's the way surrogacy will go in the future because of the complexities around the actual sort of management of surrogacy, um, they recognise that there needs to be clinics that have an attribution towards that and not just any old clinic that thinks that they can do it. Okay, perfect. I mean, there's a lot to take in already, but it's really important stuff. Liv, tell us more about like the work you do at Manchester Fertility because Manchester Fertility is, you know, it's been established for a number of years. Uh, it's obviously based in Manchester, just on the, just on the outskirts. Yeah. It's becoming the hub for the north yeah it's i would class it as the center of excellence for the north and midlands we'll, yeah i think we'd all agree that and manchester facility is a partner of my story journey and i think one of the advantages and Deb, you can kind of jump in here is that all of our partners we work really closely with we build a relationship we understand how each other works now some people might say well how does that impact my treatment and what i would say to them is that with my surrogacy journey, you can work with any clinic. We, you, there's no restrictions. It's all, for us, it's all about choice. But what I will caveat that with is that if you work with any of our partners, and in this occasion, I'm talking about Manchester Fertility, because of our relationship, we are able to 
support you much much better because of the relationship we have with the clinics and this is always reciprocal you know we help manchester facility become that center of excellence because we we help them understand what you know amazing looks like from a, a surrogacy point of view and we yeah. help you grow and enhance your program you you give us another network which is we, we only want to send our members to clinics where they're really going to be understood. They're really going to get that level of care where we have absolute reassurance that you're going to do everything. And I know that we, we obviously have that with, with Manchester Fertility. But, you know, how does the, what does that look like on the ground? You know, in, you know if, if, mem if members are coming to Manchester Fertility, tell us what kind of experience they can expect. So I think they can expect a very streamlined process from their perspective. You know, we try to make it as simple as possible for the intended parents and the surrogates and known egg donors if they do have their own egg donor. You know, I say to all of our initial inquiries that we get that my aim is to make your journey as easy and simple as stress-free as possible i'll do 99 percent of the work you just have to do the one percent just come to your consultations and your counseling sessions and come in for your blood screening and that's all you have to do you know and it can be as easy as that isn't it if yeah. people invest and they and they allow you to support them yeah i think it's nice when intended parents feel like they can take a step back and they don't have to be hounding me with questions every day and things like that because they already know all the answers to the questions that they've got because I've already answered them all. It's nice for them to be put at ease right from the start and know that they've got someone that is going to guide them through this journey from start to finish. And I think working with yourselves, that makes it even better because we know their journey and we know the process that they're going through and um, we can kind of carry that over to yourselves and vice versa. And mm -hmm. again, going back to what I said before about they're not speaking to a million different people about what they've been through and what they're going through. It's it's very streamlined. and Continuity, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It is. And I think it's about, you know, we can we can be more effective on your behalf because of the relationships we have you know mm -hmm. we don't have that effectiveness with some of the clinics that we don't work with but we have much more effectiveness because of the relationships we build you know i know i could call you at any point with an issue with with one of our intended parents and you would be able to help me resolve it yeah and vice versa you know and that and i think and it's not just about ips it's about surrogates it's about egg donors you know any any member that comes across uh, Manchester Fertility, we can be more effective in impacting their care, whether it's from MSJ or with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Like I said, it just it just puts the the patients at ease and makes them feel like you know they can take a step back, really. And also, I mean, I visited Manchester Fertility. It's a cracking clinic. It's really lovely. It feels really calm. Yeah. And I think that's really important because sometimes the first time you visit a, a clinic, particularly if you're a, a male and, you know, and you're going to have to produce a sample, that's quite an intimidating scenario yeah. and particularly if it's your first time you know yeah. it's about putting people at ease and preparing people for what's coming and, yeah. and, and I can see that the environment there is really aligned to help facilitate that yeah absolutely we, you know we've tried to make it as calm and relaxing as possible our receptionists are amazing so obviously they're the first people that you'd meet if you walked into our clinic they're so lovely they, they can read people like a book you know they know if somebody needs a bit of a hand holding yeah. and you know a, a sit down and a little chat or some people do just want to be left alone and to just do their own thing but you know they're always there to have a chat with you and relax you a little bit make you a coffee and I think that really kind of sets the scene especially if it, if it is your first visit into our clinic and I think that's really important for like uh, same-sex couples but I think what you can often have for hetero couples who might uh, be using say Manchester facility the first time because their fertility journey was unsuccessful at another clinic and they're now working with a clinic that does surrogacy often for hetero couples or single people they might be really triggered by a clinic they might have gone through lots of procedures they might have been unsuccessful in lots of ways and they might be dealing with a lot of trauma but haven't really dealt with the impact of their journey and now now facing potentially another clinic another set another team and another potential kind of hurdle to get over which they weren't expecting yeah absolutely i mean in our clinic we do we have a couple of different waiting areas for different types of things so it's not kind of like we cram everyone into one waiting area and it's extremely busy and you know if, if it is your first time visiting the clinic that can be very overwhelming I think if there's a lot of people there and it could make you feel very awkward I think we have two downstairs waiting areas one is for theatre so if you're coming in for egg collections or embryo transfers that's where you'd go to we have a waiting area for males that are producing a semen analysis so 
I think that again puts especially men at ease because they're not being called into a room that's full of people I think because everyone knows what you're there exactly, for exactly <laughs> you know and it, like like you said if it, if it is the first time producing a sample it it can be quite daunting and that's not that's not conducive of, of, of producing a sample as well is it it's about making sure that you're relaxed and you're not yeah. you're not over overly anxious yeah because that's not going to help you achieve the goal is it no <laughs> absolutely yeah so yeah so I think the, the whole kind of aim of the way our clinic set out is to make patients feel as relaxed as possible you know, depending on what they're going into. Um, we, our upstairs waiting area is mainly for patients that are having scans and blood tests and things like that. But yeah, we, we've we've set it out to to make sure that it's not daunting when people walk into the clinic. I can see that though, because just just from I I, I remember because it's a two it's, it's two floors that's yeah, the building floors, and yeah. it, it's a it's a decent sized clinic. Yeah, and it is kind of navigated to help people be in their areas and, and have the privacy and, and comfort that they need when yeah. exploring what their treatment options are. And this is a question really for both really, because I know that IPs through my solution get get that, that time with you, Debbie, as a clinical consultation, but what should people expect from, you know, from a time frame point of view? So if they've done an initial inquiry, how long does it kind of take to get to a point where they're actually actively starting their treatment on the, on their journey? What, what kind of is that time frame in between so from Manchester Fertility's perspective usually once you've had your initial consultation and counseling session if the patients are happy to proceed we could start the process of embryo creation straight away so we could get you in for your screening test that you need within the space of a week obviously the screening tests do take a couple of weeks to come back and um, so we would be waiting for those I think it all depends on the journey that you're going down and whether you do need an egg donor or a sperm donor because that can add a bit of extra time onto things. I would usually say if you did need an egg donor and you was getting an egg donor from ourselves because we do have our own egg bank at the clinic, maximum wait time to be matched with a donor is six months at the minute. But we do hope that that is going to be reduced. And then once you've been matched with a donor, we would have done everything within that six month time frame that you needed to do so you know all the screening tests that you needed consultations counseling consent forms free sperm as well so once you've chosen an egg donor we'd be we'd be ready to create embryos then and then obviously once that's done it's just a case of finding a surrogate if you've not already got one and then once you've found a surrogate going through the process of doing an embryo transfer yeah and what what a type of and this is a question for both really it's like what are some of the things that can delay you either moving forward or can delay your kind of the, the, the time frame that you're expecting because I think it's worth acknowledging that you know everyone there's lots of different moving parts when it when when it comes to creating embryos and it all depends on where you you start from as well you know if you're a same-sex couple and need donor eggs if you're a hetero couple that are using your own eggs if you have embryos already from IVF treatment there's lots of different scenarios what are some of the things that people don't consider that can often cause delays well, I, I think our collaboration, so from an agency perspective, working with the partner clinics that we do, we try to prepare as much as we yep. possibly can. So by, by the time they do get to clinics, we've had their semen analysis. We know that they've got sperm. We've had some screening done. We know that there's eggs. We know that there's embryos created that are sitting in a clinic somewhere and we're ready to think about transferring them to their chosen clinic. We've even thought about um, genetic screening and doing CGT testing, which can take a month now. Mm -hmm. So we prepare all of our uh, members coming through the through the agency to make sure that by the time that they get to the clinic, that a lot of this background work is being done. But I think we need to have very transparent conversations right from the very beginning, yeah, from agree. the second they come through to yeah, us, yeah. so that we're managing their, their expectations realistically. And depending on the clinic that they're going to, you know, has that clinic got its own egg bank? Has it got its own sperm bank? You know, have they got access to those gametes or do they need to think about perhaps getting sperm in from abroad or going to a, another agency for eggs. How long is the waiting list for those? Yeah. So being really, really upfront and realistic so that, you know, they're not getting upset and distraught and that the journey's not going as they thought it was going to go because yeah. we haven't managed their expectations. That's a massive yeah. part of what yeah. we do. I think you're right, Deb. I think it is about making sure that we've considered everything and the, the, yeah. the bit that we do at the start is, is to, to kind of yeah. go through all that. Because, you know, if we're helping you navigate your journey, we need to know where you're starting from. We need to know all of the parameters. We need to know anything that's going to potentially change the direction of travel that we thought we were going in or need more time to get to the optimum level so that we can move forward 
we, you know, because we're all about trying to, to achieve the most yeah. success, right? And I know that Manchester Fertility are absolutely aligned with that. And our processes uh, with our intended parents are always aligned with how we work with, with our clinic partners. And and I think that's the, the, one of the advantages of working with us is that we're so joined up with all of our partners. You should have a really smooth transition, you know. And, you know, even though there are going to be bumps in the road, which none of us could predict, you, you're kind of surrounded by this clinical scaffolding uh, that uh, translates to the clinics as well so i'm you know i'm really really confident that any members we work with we will have assessed all of the, their needs and we and we're set up to do that if we've got that wrong in the very beginning then the journey is going to be sort of struck with like big potholes along the way we need to get those those yeah. very initial bits right and that's what we're really processing through at msj and making sure that we've hit all of those at a very very early point so that by the time they get to the clinics that they've got all these in place and we know the first rules in fertility is that we have we got eggs and have we got sperm and can they meet together can they create an embryo and we need to know that and if you're matching with donor gametes have we got co-carriage that is going to cost you know an awful lot if you don't find that right down the end of the journey then you're in big trouble mm -hmm. because if you've spent six months waiting for an egg donor and you suddenly find now that you've got co-carriage with that donor and you've got to start that process all over again. So if we know genetic testing from the very early stages, then then we're in a, a an ahead of ourselves, as, as they say. It is. And I'm really yeah. proud, actually, because we've really worked hard to develop this pathway that really tries to help people navigate through all of those elements. Mm -hmm. It's about being mentally and physically ready for surrogacy it's about you know having all of those bits done ticked off and ready and it's taken time to build our pathway to where it is but you know it's I, I definitely think it's one of the best out there that gives you the best chance of success because we will have thought about all of those things uh, and it's the one that's going to give you less kind of bumps in the road because we we will have thought of, of all of those components which should we ask those awkward questions we that do. we're not afraid to ask yeah. right at the beginning because they need to be answered and understood. So I think we've covered a lot there. And I know that the listener might not be quite overwhelmed by, the, by the, the kind of information we've given, but we firmly believe that understanding this process and managing it, help you manage your expectations about what to expect is really going to put you in a better place when you start embarking on it. So, you know, if, if, if anything, I'm hoping that this the listener of this podcast is going to, at the end of it, be better prepared for what their fertility and uh, their embryo creation part of their journey looks like and that they are going to be much, much well informed. A quick one to finish off. What are the kind of the top three things for IPs to consider when exploring surrogacy? What are those kind of nuggets that you just wish everyone knew, Deb? The right agency to support you. Oh, as a given. That's <laughs> there. The right clinic that, yeah, that yeah. can provide a robust surrogacy pathway and be prepared to wait. Don't go in thinking that your journey is going to be complete in three months because that's unrealistic and yeah. it won't happen and it will set you on a downfall. Agreed. Liv? I'd say one of the main ones would be costings. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the people that I speak to don't realise how expensive surrogacy can be depending mm -hmm. on the route that you decide to go down. And, you know, if you don't already have a surrogate and you do need to seek one from an agency, that's an extra expense. So I think that's definitely something for IPs to take into consideration. Clinic, definitely, like you right said, clinic. Debbie, the right clinic, researching yep. the clinic and making sure they are the right clinic for you and the journey that you're going to go on. And then, yeah, I'd probably say agency as well. So very similar to what you've said and making sure that, you know, if you don't have a surrogate that's a friend or family member and you need to seek one, make sure you use the right surrogacy that's going to keep you informed and, you know, that, that you're going to feel comfortable with, really. Yeah, I, and I obviously agree with all of those things <laughs> because I often speak to intended parents who chose the wrong clinic and they didn't realise that till they were so far down the line. And if they'd have known potentially if they'd listen to this podcast and and, and, you, and were better informed, they might have made different choices, you know, and, and they would have been equipped with the tools to recognise what is a good clinic and what isn't the clinic for them. And I'm not saying that there are good and bad clinics, but it's about finding a clinic that is experienced in what you need and provides the services and is experienced in it versus a clinic that isn't. That clinic is not a bad clinic because they don't do surrogacy. It's just that they're not well equipped to give you the level of support that you need. And, and I think that that's the difference. 
we could go on and on. There's a lot more more to discuss, but I'm hoping that this particular episode has given you a flavor, has given you more confidence, and has also given you some tools uh, and maybe some questions to ask the clinic that you're working with. You know, you might be at the start of your journey. You might be dealing with a clinic that we don't work with that say they do surrogacy. Maybe this uh, episode is going to give you the confidence to ask about uh, success rates. It's going to give you the confidence to ask about what their process is and, and how they process it. And, and actually, there's nothing wrong with asking them how experienced they are. There's nothing wrong with asking about how many surrogacy cycles they do a year. You know, a, a good gauge, you know, you need to be doing 30 plus cycles a year. You know, that that's an experienced surrogacy clinic. Doing one or two isn't unfortunately and and however well intended that clinic are it's about as all of us have mentioned this is an expensive process sometimes people only have one shot at it you've got to make sure that you are having the right shot with the right clinic uh, to give you the best chances of success and i think if if that's the one thing that the listener takes away from the session today is is kind of have the confidence to ask questions and know what good looks like yeah i, I absolutely agree with that 100%. Just just ask the question. Don't don't be afraid to ask because, you know, clinics are set up to answer questions for you um, because they they want you to come to their clinic. So just don't be afraid to ask. It's really really key. Amazing. Look, both of you, thank you for taking the time to come to London today. I think we partner with the right people and for us partnerships are really important and that's how our members get get the best level of care. So Keep doing the amazing work you're both doing. I think you're both amazing advocates for surrogacy. And I know that you're both driven to help people, uh, which is why you're a partner with my surrogacy and in depth. That is exactly why you're part of the team. So thank you for coming up. That was an amazing episode. I mean, I could talk surrogacy all day long, but it's lovely to have such aligned partners and team members as part of this podcast. So I really think you've been spoiled on this particular one because you are getting some real insight that isn't readily available. And a lot of it really resonated with me, particularly going back to what we did wrong on our journey. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that. But again, thank you as always. Don't forget if you need your podcast fix, we're back every month. Monday, proudly sponsored by Manchester Facility, one of the top performing fertility clinics in the UK and has some of the best success rates in the north of England. If you want to find out more about My Surrogacy Journey, then head over to our website, which is mysurrogacyjourney.com, or find us on Instagram at official my surrogacy journey. If you like this episode, then please subscribe to the series and we'll have another episode out coming soon. Thank you for listening. I have been on my own today and I'm your My Surrogacy Journey host. Goodbye. Oh, 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 oh,